John Gormley and other corporate media. And today, like many other days, I have a special guest uh, who has been on the show before. Uh, Anne, are you still there? Hello. And this is Anne Sterzinger. I just want to quickly, for the listeners with a very, very short attention span, just give a quick plug to her book, Nusquam, if I'm pronouncing that right, which I finally got a copy of after trying for many, many months. It is possible to get a copy, so just for those of you out there who are interested in reading a book, again, I haven't had a time to start it, but Ben is an author of Repute and has written all these interesting books, of which this is one. So, and uh, out there in Palm Springs, how are you doing today? <laughs> Sunny, warm, and angry. Uh, actually, it, I'm glad you mentioned this book because I am just about to release a new edition. And so the reason I'm imagining why this new edition might be necessary, just to, for those who are not following this, what is the price that you would have to pay if you went to Amazon.com like or something like that in the past like couple of weeks? I don't know how this has worked, and I don't know why, but it's fluctuating between like $800 and $1,000. And, and this is a like soft cover. I mean, it, it looks really nice. It's a fancy looking book, but like $800 is a little steep for a book. And so you've been working very hard to rectify this and to bring this book to the, the rest of the world so they can read it without having to pay a month worth of <laughs> rent. <laughs> yeah, it's been difficult because my original publisher, it was published before print on demands were a big thing. So he didn't think he was going to have to reuse the file. So he let me make my edits in the InDesign file. And... If anyone who's read Nusquam is going to be groaning when they hear that, because one of the comic conceits of that book, which is the comic, one of the comic conceits I regret the most in my entire cursed existence, is because it was a book about somebody in grad school, and that's that's not what it's really about. It's not a grad student novel because I'm not a grad student, but just to to sort of parody the sort of conventions of grad school, and also because I just read an Anne Radcliffe book that had thousands of footnotes explaining all of her cultural references, I thought, why don't I reference every cultural item that's specific to the early 21st century in here with a goofy, comedic footnote that sounds like it was written by a scholar from 500 years in the future. And I'm like looking at this right now, so I'm like seeing all these little footnotes as you're saying this. And so, like, one of them here, we got uh, 84, quote, married a girl in common people, quote, 84, a pulp song in which an heiress expresses her desire to try sex with the, quote, common people like you, you being the narrator, who clearly doesn't quite agree that he's common, being one example of that. But just little tiny footnotes like that. But Yeah, because Anne Radcliffe apparently didn't think anyone would be reading her book 500 years later. It's a romance novel. So she just put in all these references to other romance novels and all the pop culture of her time. So some scholar had a nightmare looking all this obscure shit up right. so that the reader could be like, oh yeah, that's another romance novel and this and that. And it, those footnotes were also kind of a parody of 
I mean, ever since the 80s and 90s, I guess you could blame Brett Easton Ellis for it, but essentially you could also blame MFA fiction and pretty much the whole sort of, you know, I'm going to get slammed for slamming my own generation, but the sort of whole, like, Generation X turning into millennials culture of making all these cultural references right. to, like, very ephemeral things and very immediate things in a novel. Like, if you're going to write novels, you have to admit to yourself, you're probably not going to be a massive pop cultural icon. That's not your milieu. If anything good ever happens to you in this godforsaken vocation that I decided on when I was six and have regretted ever since I was 20, if anything good ever happens to you, it's not going to be making money now. It's going to be being remembered possibly in a couple hundred years. Right. Which, which I mean, which, if you have a book like this, though, the good thing about that, I mean, not for you per se, but for the people who somehow managed to choose this one as the one that becomes remembered and saved for whatever reason, is that this is like the keystone of understanding what was going on, maybe not at that particular time, but like for a large web of culture and maybe pop culture i don't know but definitely culture that may otherwise be lost right this is the thing that you could be like oh there was a thing there was a song there was a a, a song that talked about this sort of thing and even if we lose the song at least this will be like the reference to it Right. Yeah, it's kind of like a Rosetta Stone. Yeah. I mean, not that I have enough of a delusion of grandeur to really believe that people will be reading my book in 500 years, unless I laminate it and bury it, which was kind of the conceit for my next book after that, The Talking Corpse, which kind of turned into a, no a comic novel of demonic possession. Right. But, I mean, that, that was the idea that kind of grew out of Nosquam. Like, you kind of have to be a little bit delusional to think that your book is going to be the one that people are going to be reading in 500 years. But I've been kind of doing this ever since I was a kid because I was fascinated by anthropology and archaeology and the way that, like, random shit is what gets preserved if the culture's, like, written culture and technology are lost. Okay. Like, not so much... I mean, this is included in the Romans, but they left us text. But, like, societies that didn't have writing or whose writing system was lost or we can't decode, like, you don't, we don't know them by the important proclamations of their leaders. We know them by, like, a button that somebody threw away and that got preserved. Right. So when I was a kid, I was like, what if the United States got nuked right now? And Wisconsin is so unimportant that we didn't get nuked that hard. And my, like, math paper is the only thing that survives the blast. What if future aliens come down and find this? And my math paper is the only thing that survives the blast, but I've only got the year written on it. I don't have AD or BC written on it. Like, that would How's mean that? anything anyway, right? I mean, like, yeah. it's like, this isn't the Chinese year system. Them? What is this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So to my teacher's vast confusion, it's like from that day on, I put AD on all of my school papers. <laughs> so I guess this is kind of an impulse that's dogged me all my life. Like the hopeful part of my brain said, maybe, e even though people generally ignore me now because of the way the way society is, maybe my book will be written, it will actually be read on purpose 500 years in the future. But more realistically, <laughs> what if everything is wiped the fuck out because we're such idiots, we nuke ourselves, and there's no book that's read 500 years in the future, but the alien archaeologists dig up my book, and they just look at it, and they figure out English, but they don't know what pulp is, or even what a rock band is, so right. I don't leave all these little footnotes. And it was kind of a satire of myself and my own delusions of grandeur, and everyone else's delusions of grandeur. And also, like, grad student culture, which I kind of flirted with, but I couldn't deal with undergrads, my God. I mean, millennials, when they were in college, were a fucking nightmare. But anyway, <laughs> wow, I really do tangents, don't I? You were asking me, oh, yeah, about the footnotes. Yeah. The new edition of Nestplum was a nightmare to get typeset because I had this goofy little conceit and all these footnotes and it seemed cool the first time around. But, but nobody else does this. Months. And so, like, the technology is not set up for this particular way of writing, this idea, because nobody else does it. And the, the architecture of things like InDesign and the, the industry standard is made for the typical author, right? It's made for the work stream. The editor does their job. The author does their job. Everyone has the role to play. 
like, and then there's this like square peg of someone putting <laughs> academic footnotes in one of these novels. And yeah, I should have that carved on my tombstone. The square peg. So anyway, you've got this version of Nusquam coming out, and yep. uh, it's in publishing, or what's the status of it now? I'm just, I actually found someone, Cody Boy, who is also a, an author himself, to do to fix this typesetting nightmare for me for a reasonable price. Alas, the footnotes had to become endnotes because InDesign had just fucked them beyond recognition. So <laughs> I think at least at least the Kindle version is endnotes rather than footnotes. And I think the paperback version might be endnotes rather than footnotes too. I'll check and put it in the product description. There we go. But yeah. But basically all I have to do is sign up for the new create space now that it's been bought out by something else and and figure out how to get the old cover to fit because my former publisher is graciously allowing me to reuse the Kevin Slaughter design cover and fill the guy that I bartered. The new cover isn't ready yet because I bartered editing this dude's novel for him doing covers for me, but I edited the novel, but the covers are not done yet. Hint, hint, dude. Um, <laughs> so, so my, yeah, that's been kind of the hold up on Electra's Revenge, too, which actually, that is a brand new book. Nusla is a book that I wrote in 2007. It presaged the men's rights movement, by the way. I was the old... This is the other wonderful thing about being a square peg. I have the idea like five or ten years before the movement where everyone makes money occurs. Okay. You know, in, in 2007, I'm writing this sort of... Uh, th that wasn't my intention. I'm not a political novelist, but the ideas and the perspective definitely would have been the novel that men's rights activists would have wanted to write if they were capable of writing a good <laughs> novel. Let's put it that way. Okay. But since I wrote it in 2007, it was published in 2010. Also, I'm a girl. Also, I'm not on YouTube much. Yeah, other people made the money for that idea. But I was an old school sort of OG men's rights. Anyway, this one is rather old, but it's it's so far the novel of mine that people know and love the best, despite its funky name. Um, and I've been getting a lot of requests to, you know, <laughs> provide a new edition because no one really wants to pay $900 to read a novel, even right. though it's pretty long. Still, $900. That's a lot of movies. So, uh, yeah, and, and we, the new... Sorry? We were talking a little bit on the, the $900 side, where, like, as far as, like, one month of rent, right? Because this is at least here local to Saskatchewan. That's what I pay rent. That is, like, the one month of rent, more or less. And we were, we were talking a little bit before we started about rent local to you and how, basically, the way that the market system is set up near you is that if prices go down, strange things start to happen. So, I'm, like, you're able to reduce the, the price of your book just fine, of course, because you'll actually be able to publish, make a little bit of money off of the book, perhaps. That is a normal <laughs> function of the market. And then on the rent side, if rent drops to like less than one one book <laughs> worth, <laughs> then yeah, what what happens in that case? Oh yeah, this, is, this discussion was the result of Jeff asking me how I ended up in Palm Springs, California, which is a long ass story involving what? Sexual assault, typhus, a murdered cat. It's a really long story, but uh, I wound up in LA, Los Angeles, which surprised a lot of people because it's not really my kind of town, but I do hate cold weather. So I wound up in Los Angeles. I lost my apartment to my subletter because of a new COVID restriction, which is the dumbest COVID restriction you could possibly imagine. And I'm just going to like pause here, right? Because when people are paying $900 for this book, that money is totally going to you, right? So you're able to pay your rent with that $900? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. No, no. By the way, that's not the real price of the book. The new edition coming out is going to be maybe, I don't know, between $10 and $20, something reasonable. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to look at what Create, Create Space says. But anyway, uh, yeah, my book is not $900. You should not pay $900 for it because I... I actually got all of my copies of my own books and my friends' books stolen in this mess. So whoever's selling my book for $900 <laughs> probably stole it, okay? <laughs> On top of that, I lose my part 
gotten into this shifty ass subletter in LA right. where I'm trapped now because of COVID. I was going to move to Paris, France because of another long chain of events. This one, a good one, believe it or not. Well, it includes someone. I love dying, but at least it had a good ending for me. Wow, that sounded really callous. I love her dearly. Anyway, <laughs> you know, when all of your stories are so fucking long and involved, it's really hard not to sound like an asshole without going over every tiny bit of it. Right. But anyway, I get, I, I get trapped in L.A. again after almost escaping to Paris, but I came back here to get my trusty cats and to put my rapist in prison, and I got stuck in L.A. I thought, okay, well, I'll just move back into my apartment. That didn't work out. I needed a new apartment. So I moved into an Airbnb, figuring, you know, it's COVID. The news says everybody's bailing out of LA. People are abandoning their apartments, going back to Kansas. This will at least reduce the number of kids who become meth heads while they're trying to become movie stars. But uh, all these apartments are opening up. The rent market should finally be favoring renters in LA. Or, or at least, like, in... approximately favoring renters. Like, in a relative sense. Like, getting close to everywhere else in the United States, perhaps rather than totally bonkers, right? Yeah, totally insane. I mean, L.A. is a town that, like, 20,000 new people move to a year to try to become movie stars, and it's a town that's absolutely smothered in single-family housing. Like, a, a, a house that takes up an eighth of a city block, and this is districted all over. So it's a real estate nightmare if you're on the renting end. Right. But I thought, wow, for once, you know, there's, there's a, every cloud is a silver lining. This COVID disaster is terrible. But for once, the renters in L.A. will be able to sort of dictate the prices because everybody's failing. Well, no, I waited two months of bashing my head against the wall in a shitty Airbnb, waiting for the rent to drop down to just one roll. And it didn't. And I was getting more and more vexed, and somebody finally explained it to me. All these landlords, they're developers. They want to extend their empire and grow it as fast as possible. So they don't outright own a lot of these buildings. They buy them from the bank, not with cash, but on a mortgage. And if they reduced, uh, their mortgage terms were based on the rent that they can charge in that building. And if they drop their rent for whatever reason, their mortgage gets all fucked up when they lose money. Right. So instead of dropping their prices, they're just not renting these apartments because they're such stubborn, greedy fuckheads that they would rather just not have any income at all and lose the property Rather, I mean, they're not trying to lose the property, but they're just stubborn refusal to drop the rent and lose that property value. It means they're probably going to lose the property altogether because nobody who's staying in LA can afford that rent anymore. I mean, their prop the mayor might use their property by sticking a homeless person smoking meth in there, right. but, but there just aren't the number of people who can spend $4,500 a month or whatever it is for a one bedroom there. And so the and banks are putting up with it because I imagine at some level the buck has to stop right and is that at the banks is it like a step up at like the insurance the banks pay like at what point does that break or is that apparent at this point you know what i'm not sure i'm guessing if this goes on long enough and you know, i keep looking in the, at the rents in la out of curiosity because i've been getting lots of lucrative job offers downtown you know all the jobs that they wanted more tractable millennials to have but now all the millennials are free in terror they're like oh yeah that's right. You older people have far superior skills. We just didn't want to deal with your being trained and having critical thinking skills. And, 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 and ex that. expecting a wage more than minimum, perhaps, or like more than just like five hours a week, that sort of thing. Yeah. But all of a sudden, all the millennials have fled because they're pussies. <laughs> and, you know, they need people to fill these jobs. And they're desperately trying to, the, the offers go up and up and up and up. Well, look at the rent prices. The offers are going up, but the rent prices are not going down. They're not budging. And but the vacancy is going up. Huh. And so what I predict is gonna happen is either if they have enough properties elsewhere, the developers themselves might stay afloat and they might hang on to the building. In which case the buildings are going to be squatted, they're gonna be broken down. A lot of these luxury apartments are not very well built. 
They okay. shouldn't be renting for what they rent for. And there's going to be a few years of squatting. LA's downtown wasn't doing all that well anyway. It's going to crumble. Right. The neighborhoods are probably going to crumble. It's going to be an absolute shit show in a lot of parts of that town because the would-be movie stars are being chased away. The rich people are being chased so, away. So on, on top of like the COVID pushing people out of the large cities like LA, for example, the other kind of main force going on this year other than COVID has been the Black Lives Matter protest. And yeah. so the last time I tried to like follow what was going on, the mainstream media stopped really. I mean, it talks about it a little bit, but it apparently stopped talking about the protests that were going on kind of at an everyday level, uh, people going into neighborhoods and co- things happening in those neighborhoods. I mean, the, the last time it really moved the needle was during the Kenosha uh, shooting. But as far as local to you, are the Black Lives Matter protests still going on? Is it like the, the level of destruction we've seen in other cities? Is it happening, if not in Palm Springs and in LA generally? What is the, that impact on that side? Well, that's one of the reasons I love Palm Springs so much. <laughs> it's so cut off from the world, even though it's right, it's like 100 miles from LA, but it's, it's on its own planet. They're really, the, the biggest impact on Palm Springs has been, well, there's been one fire in Palm Springs, but it's isolated from the town. It was kind of on the other side of the mountain. But the biggest impact on Palm Springs has been the smoke from all the wildfires in the entire west coast of the United States. It's like, oh yeah, right. <laughs> California's on fire. I forgot to mention that part. Might be worth bringing yeah. that up at some point. It's kind of like my personal life. Like the whole world is like my life right now. There's so much bizarre and fucked up shit going on that if you, sometimes you forget to even explain the most obvious stuff. Yeah, I'm in the middle of a bunch of fires. But yeah, California's on fire, including Palm Springs. But once again, the main part of the town is so surrounded by desert that we haven't had to be evacuated because... It's, You've got that desert fire break. Yeah, like yeah. you can't burn sand. And also, there just isn't that big of a population here that's here permanently. It's a lot of tourists who will brawl in their hotels, but if you're a tourist, you probably aren't rioting. Right. I mean, I could see... Like, they're definitely like tourists who riot, but they're not but, generally the same tourists who will go to a place like Palm Spring, perhaps? Like, there were definitely, in, for example, Kenosha, I've, I've seen reports on both sides of, like, the Black Lives Matter people came from all over, the other side came from all over, and there are events like that taking place where you could see that as a form of tourism in a way, but this is a different kind of tourism, I guess. Right. Uh, I mean, I guess I could actually see Black Lives Matter coming here just to harass the tourists and call them white privileged as they eat at the restaurants here. But about, I'd say a quarter of the tourists here, are, I'd, I'd say only like a quarter to a third of the tourists here are white anyway. Interesting. I mean, not that they really discriminate <laughs> anymore. Well, they just sort of discriminate, but they have all kinds of excuses for calling black people basically white if they don't do what the protesters want. Okay. But you know what I mean. Like, it's no longer the hotbed of white movie stars that it used to be. So, yeah, we're, I'm kind of in the eye of a storm here. Okay, so that part isn't so much in Palm Springs, but as far as L.A. is concerned, do like, is it just, like, far away enough that you haven't interacted with it? Or is it, like, as far as the city being able to sustain itself, is there still rioting going on, et cetera? Well, the, the city couldn't sustain itself to begin with. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I go back there once in a while to deal with practical things and try to see people. Let's see. Oh, the last time I was there was a few days ago, and I was there because, well, A, I can't, seem to find my psychiatrist. I think he's having a nervous breakdown himself, which that's how far gone things are. <laughs> you can't talk to your psychiatrist because he's losing it. And, and usually that's kind of, like psychiatrists, in, in my understanding, tend to have a support network. Right, like they they're supposed to have someone that they can go to, and if they're having a nervous breakdown, that's a pretty good sign that their support network is broken, right? So it's like it's not just that your psychiatrist has fallen off; it's a there is a support network that's fallen off with him, sort of thing. So yeah. Yeah, Jesus. 
That's the, the more I think about that, the more frightening it is. But my sort of ulterior motive for going there was to check out what the commune between Palm Springs and LA would be like if I if I were to take one of these lucrative job offers I've been getting. Okay. But I can't drive because I don't have a depth perception. I would just crash into things. So I would be commuting via bus. So the day I do this, I get on the bus. There's only one bus from Palm Springs to LA. It takes off at 4.30 in the morning. I get to LA about 7.30. I'm in Union Station. And, and these buses here. are still running during the COVID era, right? Yeah, they're running. This is so fucking stupid. They're running on a reduced schedule as if that helps anything. Yeah, because, so that's going to put everyone who would ride the bus in a tighter packed bus, right? Exactly. Like, Wow, you guys are really helping by forcing people to sit closer together. And of course, half of the people, more than half the people, are too fucking dumb to actually understand why you wear a mask or how it works. Where to put it? (laughs) It's like, mask goes on your mouth, not other places. Yeah, like you don't keep it in your pocket with your used condoms. You don't stick your fucking nose out. I I just, I, I think I saw, blanking on his name right now, but the guy who did oh, Borat, the guy who does Borat, had like this big advertisement for I think it's Borat too, where it was like him in wearing just a mask, and you can kind of imagine where that mask would be. But like that's the <laughs> the level of yeah. Yeah. Before the internet, I didn't realize that George Carlin didn't even go far enough when he said, think of how stupid the average person is and then think that half of them are dumber than that. Like, I'd say 80% of the world is fucking Borat, you know? (laughs) Or at least the world that rides the Flix bus. Anyway, I get to Union Station, and the first thing that happens is this sort of, like, early middle-aged black dude with, like, the mask that's just over the mouth and not the nose accosts me as I'm walking off the bus and starts... So, and so this like this is your first attempt to take the bus in scouting out your job. Yep. You're trying to measure the distance. You're like, is this trip the one to take? And okay, so then this is the the one where you you encounter this guy. Continue. Uh, yeah. Okay. I encounter this guy, and even though I clearly just came off of a bus, he sort of pimp rolls up to me and goes, "Up, oh, so you wait for the sixth bus?" And I'm like, "No." And I walk around and I continue to the station, and he walks after me. And so this guy, is he bigger than you? Physically, how do you two compare? He's intimidating. Not huge, but most men are intimidating to most women. And this was, let's just say it's an average case of a man and a woman. Okay. <laughs> I guess the station is not very crowded, to my dismay. So he, after I tell him, no, I'm not waiting for the sixth bus. I have no idea where it is or when it'll be here. Sorry. I continue towards the... I mean, like everything in L.A., the Union Station is half-assed. It's not what you would imagine. Like, there's no really clearly marked bus terminals. But anyway, I head to the escalator that will take me into the underground where you would get on the metro, the, okay. the trains. And even though his first excuse for talking to me was that he was looking for the six bus, he immediately spins on his heels and follows me down into the metro. Always a good sign, right? Yeah, so I'm like, uh, yeah, I told you, I don't know where the sixth bus is, and also fuck off. Which really wasn't the smartest thing I could have said, but, you know, after being, you know, I try to be a nice person, but after being sexually assaulted a couple of years ago, I just, I don't, I don't have time for it. I really fucking don't. Right. I'm not giving this dude the benefit of the doubt, because... Yeah, if you're asking me where the six bus is, and then you immediately follow me away from the six bus, I'm pretty sure you weren't looking for the bus. You're right. just looking for someone to pass to. And on top of that, I'm sure at this point you're picking up on, like, body language, little subtle subconscious cues here or there that's probably doing, giving some kind of fighter sense sort of thing, right? Yeah, like the, uh, this guy wants to put his dick in something, anything, spider sense, which is a big drag to me, because I don't dress all that slutty, and I don't know what, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, that I'm the one that these people always latch on to these days. I walk past a group of very young girls with, like, their skirt isn't covering their entire ass, right. and they're wearing fuck-me pumps, as Amy Winehouse would say, and yet I'm the one that these dirtbags follow. I don't get it. Are you the only one that's, like, dressed somewhat modestly? Is that it? Could be. Could be. I'm a challenge. I mean, I thought I just dressed regular. Or maybe... I don't know. I'm putting out some kind of vibe. But anyway, actually, this one, there was really nobody else around, so maybe it was just 
I was the only person there. But this is on top of the homeless guy who grabbed my pussy last week for not saying hello to him. So he had to show me how important he was by running up to me in the middle of the evening after it's dark outside the grocery store. I, I, it's up and coming from all sides. It's not flattering, actually. Just that isn't me. how you actually, in fact, pick up women? Just, like, literally grabbing them and picking them up, that sort of thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ugh. So this guy in Union Station, he, he keeps following me. I don't know if I want to transcribe the entire tiresome conversation for you, but I say to a couple of, I do see a couple of security guards, and I'm like, could you guys like get rid of this dude? And they kind of ignore me because the guy does his little like, hey, uh, I don't know, she's a bitch. I don't know what her problem is. And, you know, they just let him go and he's following. Okay. So I'm like, fuck, okay, I'll let him pretend he's on his way to catch some train or something. And I duck into, like, a ticket booth real quick, and I stand there, and I buy my ticket, and I waste a bunch of time. I'm like, there's no way he can keep pretending that he's just happening to walk behind me, even though he's walking away from the bus he just asked me about. So I wait about five minutes. You know, he walks past. He's got to be gone, right? Okay. I come out and head down toward the red line, and he pops out from behind the place that he's been hiding. So the red line being, like, a place to stand for the train, or...? Yeah, the red line is... It was heading to the red line platform. The red line is... It goes between North Hollywood and downtown. Okay. And that was my destination, and I was heading events, and... He's, he pops out from behind wherever he's been hiding, waiting for me to get done hiding. And he goes, wow, we just keep winding up in the same place, don't we? And at this point, I'm having great flashbacks. I'm terrified. I want to punch this guy till he stops breathing. Right. And I'm like, you don't do this kind of shit. But I guess if this is the kind of shit that didn't happen quite as often before the whole BLM empowerment thing. So if this is your idea of equality and empowerment, shove it right up your asshole. And I don't even remember what I was yelling. I just started yelling at him to get the fuck away from me. And finally, because there were two or three Metro employees watching, right. he walked he walks away. And I'm like shaking. And I go into Starbucks to get more coffee because that's a really good solution for when you're shaking. Yeah, more caffeine, more yeah. anxiety, liquid anxiety. It, just pour another cup. Yeah, like I'm suffering from a massive adrenaline rush, so I think I'll throw some caffeine on top of it. I'm standing there just shaking and drinking my cup of coffee. Just going, you know, harassing me is not going to end slavery 300 years ago. Just ask the fuck why I. Yeah. I know you want to punish the white man for his woman, but I'm not the woman, okay? If there's a single woman that you want to get, it ain't me. Right. Believe me. So, yeah, that, that was my attempt to feel out whether I wanted to commute to or move back to L.A. And uh, it was that, that was the beginning. And after that, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> going to keep freelancing. So on the topic of guys who kind of ignore women's boundaries and have a long history of that sort of thing. So you watched the U.S. presidential debate recently. Yeah, I'm kind of ashamed to admit that. It's one of the more masochistic things I've done to myself. <laughs> so for like the future as far as understanding the, the political situation in the U.S. right now, what did you take from it as far as that debate is concerned? I think I've kind of been hallucinating this entire year, or I hope so. I think we all kind of hope that at this point. <laughs> I mean, a year ago, it looked like somebody rational, like Andrew Yang, might actually have a shot at the Democratic nomination. But the DNC kind of decided that they're going to be like KFC. Kentucky Fried Chicken has to call themselves KFC illegally because there's no chicken in it. <laughs> okay. Kind of and like... the Democratic Nas National Committee has to be called the DNC because there's no longer any democracy in it. Right. So, like, I, I, the whole Iowa fiasco, and the, I actually only started paying attention to Andrew Yang once they had a couple of Democratic debates, and there was this one dude whose microphone kept getting quote unquote accidentally muted. Right, and that was and I, that was Yang, right? That was Yang, and I was like, <laughs> one of my rules is don't ever give a shit about any politicians because they're just garbage human beings. But one of my other rules is always listen to the guy that they're trying to shut up. Which, I'm just going to pause and remind people that this is actually Ben Book Week. 
So this is the week to like if you're if you don't do it normally, go out and like look for someone who's got their mic shut off or got their book banned or burned or you've got the person calling for them to be silenced because this is kind of a week that at least libraries are trying to get that normalized to not happen. But so yeah, at least apply to politicians. You see the guy with his his mic cut off and you go, hmm, what's he have to yeah. say? Yeah, we might have some good ideas. Oh, and by the way, buy my books for Banned Book Week, because although they haven't been officially banned, I've been blacklisted or just ignored practically everywhere. And not just because I belong to the smallest quote-unquote generation in media. Right. It's just because I am a square peg, and people are very, very angry about keeping their round holes free of square pegs these days. So buy it before it gets banned, because... If anyone actually starts paying attention to your books, <laughs> you know. So. Yeah, they'll be banned in the next 10 minutes, so get it while you can. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be a hundred monkeys thing where, oh yeah, this woman's been writing for X years and she's really funny and we should check her out. And, oh my God, she's got to be banned. Yeah. I'm not sure what for. I don't have a trademarked offensive thing that I like to say. I try to get along with everybody, except I am pretty prejudiced against stupid people, which probably is going to be illegal soon. But that being said, I always pretty much speak my mind. Right. So, like, I'm sure everyone's got something in their mind that's going to be banned. Right. Or has been already. So, yeah, I, I probably will be banned. I just don't know what, what for. But uh, what the fuck was I saying? The debate, DNC, Yang. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I've always been a tangent person, but it's gotten much worse since I had that hundred and whatever degree typhus fever that should have killed me. <laughs> right. So the Democratic debates were all a shit show because there was one person who was rational and they kept cutting off his mic. I mean, he had amazing grassroots support, and but he kind of gave up after Iowa because I don't know if anyone remembers Iowa anymore. But it was such a shit show. Like, you could see in districts where it was between Yang or Tulsi Gabbard and Pete, Pete Buttface, like, you could actually see people cheating on the coin flip. There's videos. It was insane. And Yang kind of went, okay, they're, without overwhelming landslide support, they're just not going to let me win here because right. it's not in their best interest. So I'm not going to keep taking people's money and wasting it. I'm just going to drop out and regroup for 2024 and whatever else good I can do for civilization before it collapses entirely. So we could have had that guy as the Democratic contender to go up against Trump. Right. We could have had that guy. He was ready to go. Grassroots support, everything, set ideas, an answer for everything, original but really sane sounding policy ideas. Artie has built his own company, has experience in the private sector, in the public sector, was born, I think, six days after me, which did prejudice me toward him a bit, I have to admit. But it also um, does something like, one, makes it so he's probably not going to die of COVID, if, even if he gets it, unlike the current president of the United States, which, another thing that happened this week, Trump got COVID, and I mean, at his age, he's probably going to make it, but it's starting to be questionable, right? Whereas yeah. Andrew Yang, like, he would probably make it through. It's, there's a risk, but, I mean, things like that, right? There are benefits to having someone who isn't an octogenarian, like, yeah. is your leader of your country, and he would be that that person or we could choose between two of them right yeah we could choose between two i mean you want me to sum that debate up in just one elevator pitch it came off as two very angry old fucks in the cafeteria at an old folks home fighting over a dish of prunes so they're both constipated they both really need the prunes there's only one left and this is what their world has come back to that's what it sounded like to me Right. I mean, what happened to Yang, yes, part of it is because the DNC are a bunch of control freaks. And probably, this is one of my paranoid delusions. I don't think it's a delusion, though. I think the reason the DNC runs like that is because if you have enough power in the DNC, you kind of get on an informal list. And everybody, if they do their service, if they put in their time, you get moved to the top of the list and we'll let you have your run at president. I'm starting to think that's how it works. But it also... What they did to Yang also put fuel on the fire of my other conspiracy, which I call the war against the middle age. Okay. When people talk about generational clashes in the media, they usually talk about like Generation X and the boomers and the millennials. 
But really, everybody passes through the life stages of being young, being middle-aged, and being old. And people who are in the middle of their middle age are the people who should be running the country. Because you've lived long enough not to be callow and stupid, you know what's going on, but you haven't lived so long that you're cranky and frail. And, like, on top of that, like, that you represent the country, like, especially in a democracy, right? Like, you're supposed to actually represent the country in some important sense, right? Like, it'd be one thing, like, Queen Elizabeth, I mean, she's been around for apparently longer than chocolate chip cookies, I learned this week, and, like, <laughs> so, I mean, in a monarchy, that kind of makes sense. The longer the monarch reigns, the more stable, less political transitions, etc., etc., but, like, in a democracy, the person in charge is, I mean, maybe a little bit older than the average, but they should be an everyman, right? Like, they, they should, in some sense, have this, like, connection with the country itself rather than just being so, another guy from the old folks home who half their friends are dead right <laughs> like mm -hmm. yeah no shit i mean it's i'm back back when kennedy was president you could have a middle-aged president but right. for some reason and this i remember when i was a kid watching saturday night live and they had this figure of fun that everyone laughed at it was called middle-aged man and he was always saying that he would work on this gut he's getting and it was just mercilessly making fun of people who are middle-aged i mean there's so much in our culture that mercilessly rags on people who are middle-aged as though i mean i'm i don't know how old you are i'm 45 i'm like prime middle-aged right now i should be running a media outlet but instead they have millennials running media outlets because when people my age turn about 30 the switch to internet happened and they decided that a they wanted a workforce that baby boomers thought were good with technology. Actually, it turns out people my age are better with technology than millennials, but when someone's got a mass media ID in their head, don't ever ask them to let go of it. Well, and I think that this trend of like the old ancient people being in charge and control of anything, it is starting to, there is pushback starting from the millennials. Like they are starting to get political power as a group, as a cohort. And like you said, like that is at the cost of the people just slightly older than them who are like in neither group. <laughs> so there, there is this transition happening, but obviously in the case of the highest levels of political power, we're still seeing the ancient, the boomers still holding onto the reins of power. The, I mean, Fox News, I don't know if their cohort has all died yet, but they're still around, so that can't have happened. And that dynamic is still taking place. And from the peanut gallery, there's a comment saying they're a septenarian, but yes, Biden and Trump are in their 70s right now, but in four years, like how old will each of them be, right? And so that's what we should be thinking right at this moment is over the course of the presidency, how what their ages are going to be. But anyway, continue. Right. Yeah. I mean, it may be just because uh, if you'll notice, uh, all boomer politicians usually defer to millennials and pretend, I mean, middle-aged people kind of span right now, the younger boomers, Generation X, and what the media calls millennials. I really think it's more informative to divide people based on what age stage they're actually, what life stage they're actually in, right? Okay. Because if you're a boomer and you're 40 and you think, yeah, my generation runs the country and we should run it forever. Yeah, that's totally legitimate when you're 45 or 50, but it's no longer so legitimate when you're 80. Right. But for some reason, life is long and people's memories are shit. And the same generation that used to say, don't trust anyone over 30, wound up saying, don't give power to anyone under 30, unless we can't function anymore, and then we'll give it to our grandkids. Right. But, but I, Good luck, guys. <laughs> yeah. Like, we just skip the people in the middle who knew what they were doing. It's just, obviously, it harms me personally, but also it's a terrible civilizational move. To have people who are really too young to know what's going on and people who are really too old to know what's going on calling all the shots. It's just, and like I said, I, I don't want to take it too personally and be like, they're just discriminating against my generation because we're a minority and blah, blah, blah. Like that's not very helpful or productive. Right. I'm just trying to see whether it's just a function of these demographic blips, like different birth years have different numbers of people and that causes huge waves in a democracy for better or for worse, or whether our culture really is so averse to competence that we're never going to let 
middle-aged people lead again. <laughs> right, and I think there is a push right now to, against competence being seen as a virtue and being seen on its own as something valuable because, like, you need to, first of all, you need usually to be literate, to be competent at complex tasks, right? And I encountered someone this week who's 16 years old, literally illiterate. Like, there's no reading skill at all there. And it's not just her. There is a problem in sustaining complex thought complex writing, complex understanding, and being able to cut through and not just communicate from person to person, but to have at a cultural level an understanding that is shared from generation to generation. And I think, as you say, like there's the waves of birth years are, are adding and compounding that, but that is certainly a, a part of it. And in the meanwhile, though, we are starting to get near the end of the show. So do you want to quickly wrap up the debate thing as far as the, the COVID and debate thing you mentioned earlier? Or? Wow, me and my lengthy aside. Yeah, it was before the debate, I just thought Joe was a silly old doddering man. But I mean, everyone was talking about how nasty Trump was. I mean, we're used to Trump being nasty. Right. And he's also funny. He's not so much nasty as he is crass and kind of a jerk sometimes. But Biden, in when he's talking to somebody he doesn't like or to an adversary, behind the doddering dog pony soldier senseless old man, there's a really nasty spirit. Okay. And kind of a stupidly nasty spirit, like repeatedly calling your opponent a clown. Like, A, if you're going to keep insulting somebody, bury your insults. Nobody wants to hear you just yelping clown, 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 like those toy birds that duck and drink the water and just mechanically go up and down again. Okay. That's not even an entertaining insult. That's just you just being a pure, almost mindless asshole. Right. And second, once again, we're used to Trump being kind of playing fast and loose with the facts once in a while, even though... Part of why we like him is, in some important ways, he's very honest, even if we hate him. But possibly because he's so used to living in a media bubble where everyone kind of wipes his ass for him. Right. Like, Biden was just, like, serial lying in the most obvious way. But there are still people out there who believe him. And it's... Which makes sense, it, like, because it, it takes time and effort to check on lies, right? And if right. no one is doing that work, then... It's easy to buy in accidentally. Yeah, exactly. I Especially mean, if I, your I, alternative I, is basically Trump and his version of the truth versus this other guy, if regardless of how well you follow him, etc. But also another thing I want to point out, I just actually uh, listened to, there's a Democracy Now! clip from March that was basically once he started talking, or I mean, as part of his running for uh, public office this time around, one of his uh, sexual assault victims came out of the woodworks to talk about her experience with him and sort of like the view of the other side of him that you, you don't see on TV, the, the way that he talks to people who, again, like are not on his good side, right? That that comes out very strongly in that. So I found that one kind of interesting, but continue. Yeah, I was upset by getting that glimpse of his character, thinking this could be our president. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i an old mud wrestler, so I don't mind Trump being involved with wrestling, but reality TV? I mean, come on. So <laughs> there's been enough, there's been enough we elected the reality TV guy. Right. Are we also going to elect this nasty little privileged who keeps saying Scranton to make it sound like he's not a millionaire. It, it just, it was so disturbing, and it disturbs me that the media goes along so willingly with all these lies. And like you said, to the point where most people don't, even if you know, even if you have the critical thinking skills to realize that both Fox News and MSNBC have their slant and they're not telling you the truth all the time. Right. Even if you're aware enough to realize that, nobody has time to check on all the lies because they're just like one after another. People right. were asking Trump, why did you interrupt Joe so much? And well, Joe interrupted first and set the precedent. And also Trump is an asshole. But Trump even said, like, Joe was just piling up so many lies, like I couldn't keep track of them at all to address them later. And it's not that Trump never lies, it's just that this daughter 
hiring an old nasty rapist who's been propped up as the candidate of the DNC is being allowed to just lie and lie and lie and the press runs interference for him and they've somehow managed to get all of Me Too to forget about all his sexual harassment charges or allegations. It's just that I have to stop thinking about it at some point and go swimming and play in the mountains or I'll go nuts because I've got this thing about lying and it's so thick on the ground. I don't know, maybe that's part of a strategy to get all the people who care about truthfulness in public life to just get up, give up. And yeah, just like exhaust the capability because Trump pushed that line pretty far, right? In terms of exhausting the ability of fact checkers to keep up with him and maybe the next step of the next four years is just going to be like another order of magnitude of like thickness of lies on top of that where we just all throw up our hands and go w whatever right yeah anyway yeah. I mean, so we are getting close to the end so is there any last thing you'd like to tell the world now that you've got the world's attention and maybe <laughs> pump a book or something yeah with that this is my problem with self-promotion. I get so into my asides that I forget to mention, oh yeah, I don't I don't just float around a pool in Palm Springs ranting about old men. I also write novels, which I think are hilariously funny. I mean, I don't think they're hilariously funny two days after I edit them for the tenth time, but if I look at them three years later, I think they're funny. Anyway, like we just said, I'm in the next couple of days, I'm going to put out a brand new edition of my cult novel, Nisquam, that everybody's trying to get their hands on, because it is funnier than shit. But I've learned a bit about writing since then. I've published a bunch of books since then. You can look them all up. Actually, my personal favorite of amongst my books right now is The Sen Vendetta, which is still available on Storm Rhino Crest. It's a funny little quick read if you don't want to read my 300 page book. But I'm still waiting for the cover artist. I think I'm just going to draw it myself and give it to the designer. I had to get a new designer because, well, that's a long story. Great designer though, awesome person. And But I'm just going to have to draw the art myself for my science fiction epic which is called Electra's Revenge, not life. There's a lot of confusion around that because, like I said, my, my self-promotion te techniques are puerile at best. That's not the right word. But I do have a Kindle version of Electra's Revenge, which is my long-awaited sci-fi epic. It's basically about how people will be hilariously pretty to each other, even long after we blow up the Earth. <laughs> There's this, uh, Peter would like it. There's a good don't be shitty to other species message. There's also a lot of carnage and quips and hilarious situations and people still working in a restaurant and getting treated like shit by customers 5,000 years from now. And it is available on Kindle. And as soon as I can get that drawing made and hand it off to the designer, there will be a hardcover version. They will be on Amazon. On, not hardcover, paperback. Sorry. Wow, this is the most I've talked to another human being in like months. I am definitely with you on that. I've been, I've had a little bit of human contact this week, but the past couple of weeks have been isolated outside of work. So if I'm a little broken in terms of attention, that might be part of it. But we will probably end on that note. So thank you, Anne, for coming on again and sharing your glimpse of the world from your vantage point. It's always appreciated. <laughs> Great to talk to you. And, and thank you for having me. No problem. And, and for those of you outside that are listening to this show, just as a reminder, there is a subscription subscribestart.com slash jeff dash cliff that will support this show that can keep it operating and keep interesting guests like Anne coming on and maybe even the odd book in my hands that sort of thing but on that note i will end the stream so hopefully we will see you all next week see you then